Hey, Amy. Hey, it looks like I don't have any access to uh, pause the recording. Same. Hmm. Oh, well. <laughs> Hi, Michelle. Hello. Hi. How is everyone? Doing great. How are you? <sighs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I signed up for this such a long time ago and I'm like, oh, you know, it's December 8th. And then here we are in yeah. the middle of everything else going on with them. You know the interns and the wrapping up the semester but we're good we're here thank you for having us yeah thank you so much for being here we're excited yes so christine will be here in a second okay um we're going to need the capability right to to um, display the slides yeah can you share your screen let's see yeah it looks like it's letting me Okay. And then so she's gonna be the one showing it. Okay. Okay. So How's it going for you? Yeah, so when she gets here, we can practice sharing screen and just make sure it all works. Okay. Um, yeah, I think we're the same as you, just wrapping up the end of the semester and surviving. <laughs> surviving, right? Yeah. Trying to get this lighting right. Um, so what where are you? in terms of your work right now? Yeah, so Amy and I are in the same cohort, so we're kind of in the same place. So we're just finishing up our classwork. Our coursework is finally ending. So it's, uh, for me at least, it's the last semester of classes. So then, same for you, Amy. Then after this, moving into the qual and the dissertation proposal and all of that, so. And you'll be done sooner than you know. This is the fun part. Is it really? What you're about to enter. It's the fun part. I'm so happy to hear that because I'm burned out at the minute. I cannot wait for the break. I'm like ready for a break. So I'm, I'm happy to hear that. That's good. So I'm trying to think your face looks familiar, Amy, but I can't, I don't know if we've ever done anything together. I'm not sure. I don't know. I actually, I'm in Louisiana. So I was only at the GSC for like a year, I guess, because I started in uh, 2019, 2020. And so then COVID hit and I was like, ah, so I ended up moving back to where, to Louisiana, which is where I'm from. Um, okay. So I haven't been around the, the GSC very often, but I was around for at least, at least a year. Oh, so yeah, maybe I did see you in passing there. Wait, which part of Louisiana? Uh, at Baton Rouge. So it's about an hour north of New Orleans. Yeah, my dad's family is from Lu Louisiana, <laughs> as they used to say, a small, small town way up in the north um, called Bastrop. Bastrop. Oh, okay, yeah. So that's that's near Shreveport. My dad's from Shreveport, and so yeah, I guess North Louisiana does usually say Louisiana. So yeah. <laughs> when you said that, I was like, I bet I bet it's somewhere in the north, Louisiana. <laughs> That's awesome. So I'm sorry, I was being rude. Uh, Christine joined us and we're gonna do, introducing my dear, dear friend, Christine to you guys. Hello. Hi. I have a dog in a crate here and I'm hoping she won't be too loud. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle knows I have a whole farm in my house. Hi, nice to meet all of you. <laughs> nice to meet you too. <laughs> So will we be seeing the animals or will they be out of sight? No, out of sight this time. <laughs> I just, she was chewing on a bone. I was like, okay, that's a little too loud. So <laughs> I had to take that out of her crate. <laughs> How are y'all doing this morning? Oh, wait, is this afternoon. It's morning for me. I'm in California. Oh, right. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I think we're all doing well. Just happy to be here. Excited for the talk. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, do you want to try sharing your screen and just make sure you have that capability? Yeah, I see it here. Yep, not a problem. Okay, great. And then I'll just make sure. Yep. Okay. And chat. Yep. Okay. Awesome. So how do you both know each other? You've been working together on projects. <laughs> do you want the short story or the long story? <laughs> Whichever is the most entertaining. <laughs> Michelle was my French tutor at UCLA when we, gosh, early 20s. I must have been 21, 22 max. <laughs> yeah. So we've known each other longer than we haven't. Wow, what an interesting start. <laughs> yeah. And it's so funny, we were just talking about this uh, earlier that we, at that time, had no idea that we would come back together and work in this capacity um, on this and that both of us would get our doctorates and that our work would be aligned in this way. Uh, so yeah, longtime friends and doing work together. Yeah. So this is my dear friend Sharon. Sharon, I'm so glad that she could make it. I sent this uh, flyer to Sharon at the very last minute yesterday. It's been crazy. Um, so this is good. What has the turnout been like for these? I know Ravit was telling me that it's been a little shaky from time to time. Yeah, it depends. I think the most we've had is maybe 25. I don't know if we've quite had 30, but we hit like the mid semester slump. And since then, it's been less than that, maybe something like that. Okay. Um, so, yeah, we advertise this one today as the last one of the semester. And we're really excited about the topic that you're covering. So, we shall see. Just FYI, you are being heard. I don't know if you heard me, but just FYI, this is already um, live. Oh, okay. Thank you, Sharon. Hey, Michelle. Out of curiosity, is it, um, I, for me, it's my last week of the semester. Is it the same over on your end? It's kind of staggered. I don't know about you. Um, some classes end this week, some classes end next week, and then oh. some deadlines go till December 20th. That's my last one. So it's oh, wow. Of, yeah, it's late. <laughs> wow, that's really late. Okay. Is it the same for you, Amy? Yeah, I think my last deadline might be a little bit earlier, but it's that, that kind of staggered. It's hard to tell when the semester really ends because I think grades are due at different times for different departments, maybe. I don't know. So. Oh, are we already recording? Okay. Yeah, so this is... This, this is will be posted online though, right? Our conversation. <laughs> no, so this is Ravit's Zoom room and we are co-hosts, so we can start, oh. the but unfortunately we can't control when to record. So normally we wouldn't have record run at this point, but um, we're hoping we can chop the video. But yeah, we yeah. won't post it. Usually can, yeah. <laughs> Let's chop that first portion off. <laughs> yeah, it's a good time. <laughs> <laughs> hi everyone. Hi Clark. Hi Aaron. Hi Huma. Hi Brittany. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Hello. Uh -oh. I'm on mute. I was trying to say uh, thanks to both of you for coming and presenting today. We're really delighted to have you. Thank you so much, Clark. It's good to see you. It's been a long time. Yes, it has, hasn't it? Yeah. Danielle, I'll just say a few things to get us going and then turn it over to you for introductions and then we'll turn it over to Michelle and Christine.
if um, we'll wait just a minute or two more for folks to get here. This is our last one this semester, right? Okay, so why don't we go ahead and get started? So uh, thank you everybody for coming. This is our last um, brown bag for this semester. Um, we are working on an exciting roster of events for next semester. Just sent out a bunch of invitations yesterday. One of those invitations was to students to reach out to us if you have interest yourself in presenting. Um, I think we're thinking about a couple of different things, both obviously uh, presentation, you know, a full, full length brown bag presentation, but we're also looking at possibly a couple of sessions where students would give more conference style presentations that would be 15 or 20 minutes. So along the line and like put several students like maybe a pre AERA session with students uh, for, you know, among the students who are uh, coming to, to have a chance to do AERA presentations or presentations for other conferences. So that's another thing we're looking at for the year. So if you're interested in either kind of presentation, um, you know, respond to the email that, uh, Danielle and Amy sent out, and um, and then we'll also have another uh, 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 another a group of great speakers from both inside and outside GSE next semester. So it will be uh, we're looking forward to next semester and hope you will join us. Um, we're also we're delighted today to have um, a presentation from. Uh, Michelle Makia and Christine Umali Kopp. And uh, I'm going to turn it over now to Danielle, who will do the introductions. And then we really look forward to um, your joint presentation today. So let me introduce our speakers today. We're very excited about this talk. So we have Dr. Michelle Makia, who is an assistant professor of professional practice here at the GSE at Rutgers. Dr. Makia supervises and teaches interns in the GSE's Urban Social Justice Teacher Ed program. And her research focuses on the social context surrounding teacher preparation and achievement among K-12 students in US schools. And we also have her friend and colleague, Dr. Christine O'Malley, Cop, who is a cultural psychologist, a professor of psychology at Santiago Canyon College in Southern California, and the founder of O'Malley Cop Consulting. Her work focuses on supporting the personal growth and awareness that are necessary to create workplace and learning environments where empathy, understanding, and inclusive collaboration are emphasized. And they are here today to present the talk centering social justice in the classroom. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for, for joining us today. Uh, we feel honored that we got this slot, right? The last slot in the series for the semester. Um, what we're going to be doing today is sharing a little bit of the work that we've both been doing together and also separately in our respective fields and institutions. Um, it's meant to be a conversation starter. As you know, this is a really thick subject. We can't treat it all in one one hour session. What we're going to do is talk to you for a little bit um, and then we're going to open it up toward the end for a bit of Q&A. Uh, but first, I think we think that it's appropriate to share with you our why, right? It's always important to understand why you're doing something and we want you to know what our why is. Um, this all got started many years ago when uh, Christine and I started noticing the similarities in our work. And we've been friends for decades since the, how long, late 80s? 90s. <laughs> yeah. yeah, since the early, early 90s. 90s. Yeah. And so we've been having these great conversations and it wasn't until relatively recently that we joined forces and said, you know what, together, separately, we're doing some really neat things, but together we can, we can do so much more. 
and it started with a problem of practice that I was having. So as someone who works with clinical interns in our teacher education program at the, at the GSE, um, and someone who teaches methods courses to those same students, I was noticing something coming up over and over and over, and I wasn't quite sure how to deal with it eventually. Initially, I thought I knew what to do, but I eventually hit a wall. Let me tell you what it is. So I was hearing from um, students in my classes that they understand where we're going with the theory, but making the connection to how it looks in practice in a real live school was something they were grappling with. And um, issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how to bring that to one's teaching. How do we do that? So that was the question, right, that, 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 that kept coming up over and over and over. Then on the other side, the students who were working in schools doing their clinical internships in preparation, right, for getting their certification, and they, they also, I was noticing struggling, they were struggling with um, how to really center their students. And then I took a look at my own teaching. I realized that although there were some key moves that I was making that were good moves to be inclusive, and to center social justice, there was so much more that I wanted to do. And I kept feeling like I just needed a little bit more time, a little bit more time at the end of every semester. So this past year was the year that I said, all right, Shell, you gotta get it together. You're reaching success with your students, but there's so much more you can do. What are you missing? And what I realized was that um, I was missing the psychological, the psychology component, the cultural psychology component. And that was when I said, all right, you gotta call Christine and you have to pick her brain so you can figure out how to become better in this work for the interns and for the students who are in your classes. And I can turn it over to you if you wanna add something, Christine. Absolutely, you know, the reason I did, um, I moved into cultural psychology as a practice um, that's focused in social or rooted in social justice is because of the own um, misinformation I learned growing up in my family and, and realizing there were so many things that they taught me without maybe intentionally um, wanting to teach me those things around bias and racism and what have you. And so that really propelled me to go into the area of cultural psych and specifically to be a practitioner. So I went to a professional school called the California School of Professional Psychology. After UCLA, I opted not to go to um, a traditional school. And that was because I wanted to be trained as a practitioner. So my doctor is actually a PsyD, not a PhD. And that was intentional choice um, because I wanted to, to be prepared um, and groomed on how to take theory and put it into practice, how to implement it. And so that's really my area of expertise. I've been just so lucky because not only have I had this background and beautiful preparation in cultural psych, I also, which is rooted in sociocultural areas of psychology. Um, so we still looked at things like power dynamics, ancestral knowledge, um, intergenerational, pain, intergenerational pain and trauma, but it's also um, multidisciplinary, looking at ethnic studies, looking at sociology. So I have, I think, just a beautiful um, combination of, of um, disciplines intermixed in my, my training in addition to industrial organizational psych or organization development. And um, added to that, I also had an opportunity to become a trained facilitator and consultant um, and working with places like the Anti-Defamation League, National Conference for Community Injustice. And so I had that lens. And then in the last 15 years, I've been really focusing on being an academic. So I've been teaching at the community college level. That was um, a choice also. I wanted to teach at that level because that's where I started my own college experience. And so um, that's really led my path to where I am today. And I feel really so lucky that now I have just a very unique lens and how to approach things around diversity, equity, and inclusion and social justice because I have this background in cultural psych. I have all this experience in academia and I also am a practitioner. Um, so that is a little bit about me. Um, and it's just been such a, um, an honor and privilege to work with Michelle, who's entrusted me with um, 
you know, doing some work and doing some facilitation and exploration with um, certain classes um, that she's had in the past. So I thank you so much for that. Um, with that, what I'll do is I'll go ahead and share my screen here and pop up our PowerPoint. And so our topic here is centering social justice in the classroom. We're gonna talk a little bit about um, the kinds of things to keep in mind, how educators influence the learning environment, how students are also a critical piece of that uh, learning environment. And then also, as Michelle mentioned, um, some of the practices that we've engaged in. So we're opening with a quote and we just wanna give you a moment to think about this quote here. You can only take a group as far as you're willing to go. Just think about that for a moment and what that means to you. It's gonna get us set on this first portion of our talk. Um, so I know Michelle, you and I have talked a, a, a lot about the bullet points here on this slide. Um, and one that has been extremely critical is understanding and recognizing who we are and that we bring all of that into the classroom. I think especially those of us who are very committed to social justice, equitizing curriculum, creating inclusive classroom environments and learning environments for our students, that sometimes we forget that piece that even though we are evolved in our awareness, in our education, that there's still so much of what we were taught before that commitment to social justice that affects not only how we are in the world, but how we perceive others and how we interact with others without us ever realizing it. And so it's important that we understand that who we are, we bring that with us into the classroom. And because of this, it's also important that for many of us, depending on the classroom setting, that we be open and willing to share a bit about our background share a bit about our experiences. Um, and I don't know if you wanna chime in here, Michelle, too. Like for me, I go into my classrooms and I say, hi, I'm Christine, I'm Filipina, I come from an immigrant family, I'm a cultural psychologist, this is what I, this is the lens that I use um, in educating and facilitating groups in our class so that they understand the tone that I'm trying to set, but also they know what I bring to the table. Yeah, I'll just add on to that really quickly. Um, the approach that I take is in the beginning, I introduce myself and I show some photos of my family, talk a little bit about my experience. But then what I do is throughout it, I'm always in giving an example of a concept that we are studying. Oh, my apologies. Sorry about that, Michelle. That's okay. Um, I teach the concept, I teach the content, and then I lace in examples. And I usually lace in examples that are matched with my own cultural uh, background. And I explain it as my perspective and my story being one way to look at this. So we're gonna look at this, we're gonna look at early literacy learning through a black African American lens. That is my story, the only story, right? It's my story, but not the only story. We're gonna look at it through this lens and my hope is that you will look at it alongside me with through your own cultural and background lens. And I really feel like it gives students permission to go there as well. If I'm willing to, as Michelle does, share who I am and talk about the things that oftentimes aren't traditionally um, disclosed in an academic environment, it gives permission for students to also feel comfortable and maybe take down some barriers that they might be feeling in um, engaging in self-disclosure. Um, and this one sometimes is really can be hard, especially for those of us who are a bit more evolved in our awareness, but understanding that we all have biases. And even when we've unlearned, um, I, I always think about it as I was given a script growing up with all these messages, and now I have to spend the rest of my life creating another script that tells me how wrong the original one was. Um, and that's for me a lifelong experience. And so I always have to be aware that no matter how much I've tried to push myself, no matter how much education and learning I've engaged in, no matter the um, multicultural community I've created that I connect with, 
that I still have those biases that were taught to me throughout my lifetime by my family, by the media, by growing up in the United States. And because they're embedded and kind of dormant in my brain, they have the potential to manifest themselves in ways that I don't ever expect in interacting with students and creating curriculum and just interacting with people on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think it's really important that we don't lose sight of that, that we are exposed to these biases, we are exposed to these prejudices, we are exposed to these stereotypes. It doesn't mean we're bad people. It just means that this is what we've learned. And so it's important for us to bear in mind and remember that we have the potential to act on what we've learned. Um, and so it's important for us to engage in things like personal growth and um, cultural, enhancing our cultural knowledge. Um, so that, that personal growth is what's included in that is, you know, unveiling those prejudices and stereotypes and biases that we've been taught, exploring our own privilege and oppression. Um, and I talk about it in class, and I know, Michelle, you and I have talked about it too. Oppression is really much easier for individuals to talk about. It's much harder to acknowledge when um, privilege has manifested in our lives. But it's really important to do both. Um, as one student said to me, she's like, you know, Christine, I've always been taught to look at one side of the coin, which is the oppression part. What I've learned in being in your class is how that on the other, other side of that coin is how I've experienced privilege. And so we have to look at both sides of that coin, um, being aware of our own implicit biases that might manifest themselves when we don't realize it. And then also that understanding that our intent does not always equal our impact, that we could have the best of intent, we could frame it and reframe it and practice it in our brains and yet the delivery and how it's received on the other end could be opposite or counter to what we had hoped. I feel like I'm talking there quite a bit, Michelle, so I didn't know if you wanted to chime in. No, we're fine. We're, I'm good. Okay. Um, and then also knowing our impact and, and how I think about this is I need to know, I have to understand that how I physically present the fact that I'm female, that I'm brown, that I'm 40 years old, that people are going to receive me with a particular lens. It doesn't matter if I'm doctor. What's going to matter oftentimes is first what people see physically in me. And so I have to understand that when I'm interacting with people, that is what they're using to interpret my message. So in that sense, I have to know my impact. I have to understand that when a student hears this from me in particular, it might be perceived differently than when they hear it from someone who looks like my husband, who's 6'1 and white and male. So when I look at that, it's understanding my impact understanding my effect on students. And, and as research shows us, and it shows us for, shown us for decades, that the messages we convey to students both directly and indirectly about how we feel about the potential to um, excel and perform, that those messages get received on the student end and can absolutely affect not only how they do academically in a classroom setting, but even how they feel about their own self-efficacy, particularly when it has to do with a, a specific subject matter. That'll take us to our, our next quote. And that's meet students where they're at, um, not where you want them to be. So if you could just kind of sit with that for a moment. And our next area is, so our first slide um, was really looking at decentering from academics, right? Um, we've been traditionally um, focused in, our, in, in the educational system to have the educator at the center, be the sage on the stage, be the deliverer, deliverer of all information. Um, placing students at the center means not only do we um, practice as educators, but we also are practical learners in that environment as well. So it's critical that we provide opportunities for self-exploration and expression, that students have the ability to not only share about their own perspectives, share about their ideas around what they're learning, but also how they can apply those things to their learning experiences. Um, this could have to do with showing how um, they are able to maybe bring a different perspective that might be 
counter or varying or diverse from their colleagues in class. Um, but it's just providing that environment where they can learn about themselves and share that um, in a, in, in a uh, safe learning environment or classroom environment. And honoring and creating space for students to share their stories. Can I jump in there really quickly? Absolutely. Well, there's an exercise that I have done with students in, in my class. I did this with students, communities, and social justice students. And what we did was a, a gallery walk of sorts, like these little conversation rooms where there were people who stepped up to sit in, a, it was virtual, right? This was last year, sit in a room and be there in the room, perhaps with a buddy or on their own, whatever their preference is, um, to, just share their story, whatever parts of their story they want to share, to just be there and to share. And they basically are like kind of on a loop and people can just rotate to the different room to just listen. These are the types of pieces of information that you only really get from someone when you have an intimate relationship with them, like an up close and personal relationship. Like if you are best friends with someone or you're a good family friend, with someone, um, you get invited into their home on a regular basis for different reasons. And so uh, we thought it was a really good way for folks to be able to just share who they are and share their stories. And what it achieved was it allowed people to have agency, feel empowered and to feel um, visible in cases where maybe they were feeling invisible. For example, last year I had some of my um, I had queer students in my class who expressed to me that they felt invisible at times throughout their career and their preparation and just in life in general and on, on, on many occasions. And um, this was an opportunity for me to demonstrate that I heard them, but then for us also to get to know one another a little better. And the students benefited from that. It was affirming. So that's just one small example of something that can be done. I know for me, um, depending on the class that I'm teaching, I spend quite a bit of time doing um, community building because it sets the tone for how the rest of the semester is going to unfold. And so one thing that I've started off with usually the first week of class is um, bring an artifact from home that's important to you because of your family or culturally, whatever. And we take however long it takes and we sit in a circle and hear every single person's story around that artifact. Um, and there've been times more often than not where there's tissue and crying, but it really creates the tone for safety, for inclusion, for identity affirmation. And I can't um, emphasize enough how important it is to, for me to start, um, to start the semester in that fashion. Um, and you know, when we're talking about self-exploration and expression, I had mentioned in enhancing cultural knowledge on the previous slide for educators that um, connected to that is inviting and learning about counter narratives. And what I mean by that is it's not just mainstream white male US culture. It's about learning about all kinds of narratives, especially those that have historically been silenced um, in our communities and developing that empathy and comp cultural competence and cultural humility. Um, we're able to better do that when we hear other people's stories. Um, what's also really critical, and there's so much research around this, is connecting curriculum to students' personal experiences and narratives. So providing opportunities for them to apply what they're learning to their own personal journeys. You know, I teach a lifespan psychology course. They take, um, they have to do uh, written papers um, throughout the semester, and it's all about applying what they've learned to their own development. And students are like, oh my gosh, I didn't have to go to therapy, Christine. <laughs> I could have just taken this class and now I understand why I've evolved in this way. And so it's making that personal connection between what they're learning and the curriculum and their personal experiences. Um, it helps them to feel seen in the classroom. It helps to um, increase their resiliency in the class and their success academically as well. So connecting that course content and connecting them to the class. Um, expressing encouragement and support for their success that can happen in so many ways. I have students who don't do well, much like you might have. Um, and I say, you know what, that's just the first exam. Let's talk it through. What are you doing? What can you do better for next time? Um, but encouraging them and reminding them of their potential. Um, and then leveling the playing field for students. Um, and how we can do that is by 
ensuring that they see themselves reflected in the classroom, that they have the sense that they belong there too, that this culture, the, the culture of learning and, and the education system is one that they belong in, um, and that they also have a place in the curriculum, curriculum that's being taught. Um, sometimes it means being flexible with projects. I've gone more and more into not just sticking to here's one final project you must do, but here's a multitude of different ones that you can choose from. And you get to kind of pick and choose which one fits for you best and where you're gonna thrive. Or, hey, come up with one and propose something to me because I my creativity can only take me so far. Maybe your creativity goes in another direction. Um, using non-biased grading strategies with things like Canvas and Blackboard um, can, can help us with by doing, if you will, blind grading. Um, and then reconsidering deadlines. So one thing I kind of stole from a, a colleague is I automatically embed a one week grace period. So I have a target deadline and then it just stays open. And as long as they get it in within that grace period, I treat it as if it was turned in on time. And most students will turn it in by the original deadline. But those who need that extra week have always come to me, oh, I'm so grateful you put that. I don't have to come and beg and feel embarrassed that I didn't make it for X, Y, and Z reason. Um, but they've expressed just such appreciation of having that built in. Um, and then just being open to student feedback. So I'm being mindful of time and I'll just go ahead and. Uh, Move on to the next slide here. Would you like to read that one, Michelle? Sure. We want to have you sit with this for a moment or two. Um, learning more about oneself builds the foundation for developing greater understanding and empathy for others. And these little quotes, I'm sorry, by the way, we I don't think we explained, are just like little beliefs that we have. They're little sayings that we use when we um, collaborate and sometimes when we are teaching this content to our students. Absolutely, and this was actually um, founded in research. So we do see the more opportunity we give individuals to explore who they are and really understand why their experience and their development is what it is, um, that it actually increases the chances that they'll be more willing to hear others and develop greater empathy for others' experiences as well. Um, so making social justice the goal, one a critical piece to this is creating a safe, inclusive learning environment. And I'm just going to, you know, Michelle, if we could tag team on this one for sure. Like one thing I do is creating learning community behaviors. So we set the tone the first week of class and commit to those. I, I don't know if there's like other things that you do that you'd like to share too. Yeah. Um, so last year, uh, I realized that there was a need for a set of norms around um, the conversations that we were having, you know, the conversations could have, many of them got very heated last school year, right? In the summer courses, like the summer, was at the summer of 20, 2019. There was just a lot going on. And so one of the things I heard from my students who reported to me privately that, you know, I'm feeling attacked. I feel like I can't say anything. I, I feel like there's no space in this conversation for me. Uh, I needed to bring in some norms. And so those norms become the first thing that we cover at the beginning of every every course. And I'm happy to share that slide. I can't do it right now because I have to dig it up, but I'm happy to share it um, if anybody is interested in seeing them. Yeah, I, I'm happy to share that too. Um, what I have that I've been using for years as well, like after the fact. Um, also honoring names. Um, for some students, their pronouns are really important. Honoring pronouns, um, honoring identities, their various cultural identities. And when I say cultural identities, I'm going beyond race, ethnicity, and skin color. Um, as a cultural psychologist, I'm looking at all the ways in which we've been shaped as cultural beings with gender, sexual orientation, um, also race and ethnicity, but also things like spiritual affiliation, um, socioeconomic status, the generation that we are in the United States. So providing a space to explore those or at least honor them and honor the intersectionality of um, how those cultural identities come to shape that person in a unique way. Um, so I think those are really important. For me, I found ways to have students, like I, I usually will start with a warm-up activity on the first day and in a face-to-face -face context, they'll write their name down um, on the sheet, give me their preferred name, and then I ask them to give me their pronouns. And if they want to, they can share their gender identity with me as well so I can address them in a way that honors who they are. And so I started doing that for many years. So it doesn't even provide opportunity for me to get the name wrong 
or to get the, the uh, to misgender a person. And so um, that's one of the things that I've also done and students have appreciated. Um, the other thing is understanding historical and systemic forms of oppression and privilege and how they work. Can we, can we just, I just want to get sure, you yeah. one example. Yeah, um, are you able to, Christine, pull up those? Yeah, do you want me to? This is us, yeah. yeah. Yep. So I'll talk over it as she pulls it up. So, um, and this is what I teach to my, the interns who I work with, right? We, we focus on um, oh, understanding sorry. who our students are. Everything that we do should be a reflection of what we know about our students, right? You talk about the teaching and learning connection and that it's so important. Well, I realized that I was telling my students you know, you need to give a survey to your students so you can understand what their interests are and who they are and what their, what their assets are, their personal, cultural, community, linguistic, all these assets. But what I realized was that I wasn't doing it myself. The information would come out through conversations over the course of the semester. But I realized, I think it was last year or the year before, it was 2020, the spring, I started giving a survey to my students. So what you're looking at right now is the first year that I did it, right? It's basic stuff. What's your program? What grade do you want to teach? You can keep scrolling. You know, like surface stuff. Cute, Michelle, really cute. As I began to dig deeper into myself and the things that I value, I realized that cultural and linguistic identity. My identity is so important. If it's important to me, it must be important to my students as well. How can I tap into that? So what I did the next year, this was last spring, I revamped the survey. So yeah, basic information. This is where they did their internships. You can just scroll through. Okay, yeah, hobbies. That's great. It's nice to talk about your hobbies. Right. Pronouns was one that I added that resonated with them. The languages spoken at home, that resonated with them. How they identify. And then the information that I got from this served as the, a springboard for discussion about, you see some of these comments? Um, somebody said, I don't really have any, you know, like they were just downplaying their cultural identity. I don't really have a culture. So we went in right there and we use that as a point of discussion that shot us into other things that needed to be discussed and explored. Um, all of this in the name of learning about one another, but also helping them understand how to do this type of work with their K-12 students. Okay. Um, and I love that. And that's why, you know, um, it seems like Michelle and I are doing similar things, but through different um, strategies of having students unveil a bit of who they are, because it is going to influence how they experience the learning environment and whether or not they feel included in that learning environment um, that we're facilitating. And I think also kind of tying it into the next bullet point, if we understand their experiences or their identities, then it can also help us understand um, how those might be um, connected to historical forms of oppression, um, privilege, how, what are some of the challenges we might experience when we're talking about things like oppression and privilege, which are at the crux of social justice, if we're trying to level the playing field. And so I think one thing that I know Michelle and I, you, have talk, you and I have talked about a lot is really having these discussions that honors people's experiences, what they bring to the table without finger pointing and blaming. You know, understand that there's a difference between the person and the system, that we might have really harsh feelings around white supremacy, but white supremacy are not white people. Right, white people, that is a person. White supremacy is a system of oppression. And so when we're looking at that, it's really important to bear these things in mind um, and be moved by the challenges and its successes that students experience. So it's not only that we understand how these systems work for some and not for others, um, or that they even exist, or even how they manifest for ourselves and our own personal um, forms of privilege and oppression, but really being moved by how it affects our students. Because when we can tap into that, then we know there's empathy there, 
then we know there's things like cultural humility there and we can partner with our students to make a, an effective learning environment and support their success. Um, and another piece is this not, is not only for educators, but for students as well, listening and sitting in discomfort. If my first reaction is to go, oh my gosh, this is why you're wrong, I get defensive, then what I really need to be doing is sitting there and listening, no matter how hard it is and being comfortable with being uncomfortable. And I think that's a really important skill set to have um, really as a social justice advocate and warrior. Being, um, speaking of being an advocate, this means not only advocating and teaching students how to do that, but advocating when I'm not in the classroom, being that voice for students when I see practices that are being implemented that don't serve them well, that don't support their success, being an advocate for colleagues, even when they're not present, being an advocate for community, even if I'm not a member of that community and challenging the status quo. Like I've been in academic Senate and it's like, okay, we, we have to stop here. Conversation stops here. Conversation stops here. I'm like, I'm sorry. You can't just com communicate our feelings around oppressive communication in 10 minutes. Like that just can't be a 10 or 20 minute discussion point on an agenda item in academic Senate. Like we need to be able to make space for that conversation in depth. So sometimes it's challenging how things are always done to be more inclusive and to be more committed to social justice. Um, and then another one that Michelle and I have talked about, and please just chime in there. I'm trying to like get through our list, um, but remembering that it's not about our ego. This is not about me. Social justice work is not about me. I am a catalyst perhaps to help it happen. I can be a facilitator in moving in that direction. I might, be so privileged as to create help create some insight in others, but it is not about me. And the moment it's about me is a moment that I have to step away. And what I mean by that is if I get stuck in my own defensiveness, if I get stuck in my own need to explain why I'm right, if I get stuck in my own way of looking at it and dismissing others without even realizing that I'm doing that, then I am making it about my ego. And sometimes and that means that that was the biggest lesson I think one of the biggest lessons for me, learning how to be vulnerable in front of my students. That is really hard to do. It's easier to do with little children, right? I taught third grade for a million years. They're so forgiving. But when you're working with adult learners and you're stepping up and you're an adult and they're an adult and they've got, some, in some cases, decades worth of experience, real world experience, it can be really challenging to step up and, it, and be Trans, fully transparent and allow yourself to be vulnerable. So I would say that was one of the things that helped me along with this work. I also continuously expressed to my students, express that um, this skin color has a, an experience behind it, but it does not give me a pass. It doesn't mean that just because I am a, a black woman um, that I, know it all, that I know the entire, there's work that I have to do as well. Absolutely, um, I'm the same way. I don't care if my background is in cultural psychology, there's things that I miss, things that I don't know. And I think that goes with, um, you kind of segued into this last bullet here of admitting when we don't know and be accountable for when we get it wrong. You know, my joke in my class is, hey, maybe you wanna make sure I get something wrong. So I apologize and I bring you cookies. <laughs> That's, I apologize through food. And, and this is pre-COVID pre obviously. Um, but there have been moments where I have my own personal reaction and I don't catch it until after I leave the classroom. And I go back in with my tail between my legs, if you will. And, and I say, I am so sorry and this is why. I may not regret the message that I conveyed, but I regret and how I delivered it. And this is why. Will you forgive me and still trust me in working with you in this class? And that has been such a powerful learning experience for me. And you know what? It alleviates the pressure. I don't have to know everything, nor should I. I can't know everything about what it means to be of every single cultural experience. That is way too much pressure. And so when we're looking at that, um, I think, like you said, Michelle, it's one of those most important learnings um, in doing this work, and particularly as an educator committed to social justice. Would you like to read this one or? Sure. 
Okay. The education system rewards obedience. It rewards compliance. It rewards following the rules, no matter how arbitrary and valueless they may be. No one ever changed the world by obeying. This one we're not going to get give ourselves credit for, <laughs> right? This is Isaac Morehouse. Um, but I think it's really important to bear in mind of how many times do we just, like I said, go with the status quo because it's how it's always been. It's much more difficult to challenge and, and think of things differently than to repeat what we've been exposed to. Um, and especially that's true for social justice work. We wanted to just take a moment too to share some um, really important um, resources. This is by all means not, all inclusive, um, but at least something to maybe wet your palate a bit more since we're just starting the conversation. So Michelle, if you wanna talk about those first three and then I'll um, actually load them up on, on uh, the shared screen. Oops. Oh, do you wanna see that first? My apologies. Uh, here, here we go. Okay, thank you. So I'm gonna make this quick because we do wanna open it up um, to questions and answering and thinking and stuff <laughs> um, in a few minutes, but uh, Goldie Muhammad's work has been really, um, it's been a game changer, definitely, certainly for me as someone who teaches early literacy. Um, the last time that I taught the course, um, I centered this notion of being responsive to the historical context. And that was the way in which we began the course. And I think that's appropriate for every, no matter what you're teaching. Every, any, any person in here, um, even people who teach in the K-12 world can start with a conversation about the historical context of the subject that's being taught or the concept that's being taught. And so in this case, in her case, what she does is she promotes, she, she unearths, she shares, she centers the experiences, the rich literacy experiences of black Americans, African Americans. Um, there's a history that we have that I certainly did not learn in high school, did not learn it in college. Um, her book, she does a wonderful job of helping us think about how to frame literacy learning in that way. Um, so you can look at, she's got these wonderful resources, she's got a lot of resources, but these two things here, one is just a treasure trove of um, resources that any educator can use. Yeah, this one right here. Um, if they are interested in developing their own or finding information on culturally and historically responsive curricula. These are the links actually do work. There's a, a, a Google Drive. I tested a couple of them out. So that's one resource. And then this is another resource of hers where she goes, she provides a list of questions to help educators think about what they're doing in terms of um, being historically responsive. And I'll leave that there. Great resources, wonderful thinking. And then I'm, I'm just gonna leave this open if it's okay, Michelle, because this is the other handout, Danielson. Absolutely. And so this is another piece um, that, that I use in my work with, uh, well, I, I, I work with it as a, as a teacher, as a classroom teacher myself. So I'm very familiar with it in that way but as somebody who is an evaluator of um, our teacher candidates learning, I focus on a lot of different things, but we spend a lot of time talking about and me looking for and us brainstorming ways to demonstrate our knowledge of students. You cannot be an effective educator if you do not know who was before you. And we'll um, be sharing a PDF of our PowerPoint that includes these. And I can always um, put some things in the chat um, just in case the links don't work in the PDF format. Um, I also wanted to share with you, Dr. Darrow Wing Su is a psychologist. He's one of the first people who started talking about this term microaggressions. He wrote a book, um, Overcoming Our Racism, which is kind of a unpacking our own baggage, if you will be a button sure, but what he's doing is trying to increase our awareness um, around race and skin color and what have you. And he has poignant questions at the end of each chapter. So it's kind of like a nice workbook 
um, kind of thing if we want to still to do our internal work and personal growth. And he also wrote a book called Race Talk and the Conspiracy of Silence. And there he gives some insights on how to effectively talk about race and racism. Um, Wood and Harris III are two men of color at San Diego State University. I believe Luke Wood is now a VP there and they're both professors in education. And they've done a lot of work around looking at success rates, looking at what young men of color need to be successful at the community college, which is like I said, the environment that I teach in. And um, I can't emphasize enough looking at the work beautiful about what the research has revealed is yes, these strategies not only work for men of color in supporting their success, but it also helps for all students. So the kinds of things that work for young men of color work for all kinds of students, no matter their background and what they look like. Um, I found a link to this um, talk that they gave. It's about an hour and a half long. You just click on there. Um, I be believe it's a talk they gave um, at a university in Illinois. And it's on equity-minded and culturally affirming teaching and learning practices in virtual learning communities. But in listening to it, I believe that they share strategies that go even just beyond the virtual learning environment. And then there's another great resource is Paul Kivel. Um, he's been doing social justice, work, just social justice work for decades, just quietly. He's up in Berkeley, in Northern California, and he's written and rewritten this book called Breeding racism. A lot of it's written um, for white individuals. He himself is white um, and how to be an ally, but it really talks just about race and racism and just kind of unpacking and unfolding that. Um, but I think his um, website is a great resource too. He has not only a listing of his books, but also activities that you can do um, and engage in that can work for all grade levels, really, not just K through 12, but also I've done some of his activities with college students too. So I just wanted to share um, that resource with, with you as well. And I know we're just about out of time. Um, this is a little bit about us, our email addresses, as well as our Instagram handles. Um, and Michelle, I see you're wanting to chime in there. Always wanting to chime in. So with that, um, we will open it up for a little Q&A. Thank you. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you for being here. I'm going to be multitasking, just taking some of these links and embedding them in the chat, just in case. Uh, I didn't realize I was on mute. I was just, I was uh, in the process of thanking you for a wonderful presentation and encouraging people to put uh, questions in chat and, or, or you can just uh, either raise your hand or uh, speak right up and ask your question. Please. Or even if it's something like a practice that you'd like to share. Aaron. Yeah, I actually have a question about the third quote and sort of in relation to this overall approach, the one about um, following rules kind of uh, pushback. Um, and, and it's maybe that I'm a little bit salty about this right now because I'm in the midst of like doing a bunch of pulling methodological citations for a paper, which feels like jumping through hoops and that sort of thing, right? And the education system rewards obedience, they're wonderful, right? Um, and there is a bit of this feeling like, you know, part of our PhD program is to continue to follow and be obedient in the right kinds of ways in terms of doing your citations in the right kinds of ways and all these sorts of things. And that compliance is still rewarded. I guess I wonder, how do you think about trying not to reproduce that while also trying to prepare your students for a world in which that is still the expectation and not sort of prepare them in such a way where, where they struggle to deal with those realities if they want to be doing this kind of work? That's a great question. Did you want to say something first, Michelle? Or no, you me? can jump in. You know, I, in how I approach the work in my classes is, okay, here's the ideal, here's the utopia, but we also have to be pragmatic and understand the world that we live in. And I was just having this conversation with a God brother, and um, I just learned that, I, I don't know if any of you've heard of this movement of unschooling or non-schooling. I haven't read up on it yet, but as an educator, I have all kinds of reactions. 
Um, and when I have had this conversation with him, I said, okay, well, you don't have him in school. You want him to pursue what it is that is of interest to him. And that's great. But what happens when he goes out into the world and at 25 decides that he may be shifting his direction and wants to get this X, Y, and Z job and people are gonna to wanna to look at his credentials. And so I think it's a slippery slope, Aaron, what you're mentioning in that, yes, we still have to abide by the system because that's how we are able to be successful. But then what we do is we use that as a way to get in the system to try to instill some change. Mm -hmm and to advocate, even if it's just in my small circle of my classroom to do it differently. And then those students pass it on. But then also at places like Academic Senate and at looking at hiring processes and at looking at what hoops are we making those students jump through and are they really necessary? So I, I don't know that I have a, a, a total answer but that's kind of how I approach it. Yeah, and then I would just add very quickly that, um, you know, this whole notion of improvisation, it looks like people are just up there just doing something off the cuff, right? Those jazz pianists, doo -doo -doo -doo, they're doing their thing, right? But they have to have a foundation first. And so the approach that I take with my students is that um, I'm giving you this foundation and this is supposed to be done in this way. And yes, there are things we have to learn to get this foundation. However, you have the ability, once you have that solid foundation, to improvise, improvise. If that means going off script, if that means, you know, hitting, hitting, hitting a note that's not going to be a popular note in that thing, but it's a part of the art, you, you can do that because you're coming from a place of anchored in knowledge. And so I let my students in on the psychology of everything. Did it in third grade, and I do it with the, with the adult learners that I work with right now. And I think if I can insert just one more piece too, as a, as a psychologist, what to me is there's such a shame that we have this knowledge around multiple kinds of intelligences. And we've known this information for decades, whether we're looking at triarchic theory or we're looking at Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences. And yet we don't integrate that on a systemic level in our educational system. There's something wrong, right? If, if we were to actually integrate that knowledge and then creating an environment that actually is built on understanding what that means for our learners, then we might not have to have this conversation because we will be already honoring the different ways in which students are stimulated and how they learn. We're not even talking about learning styles on top of that, right? And communication styles. So, I mean, there's all this research that we have that we're just not um, intentionally integrating on a systemic level in the educational system in the United States, at least not the public system. Yeah. which I am a product of. Me too. Um, Jessica had a, Jessica, would you like to elaborate on your question and then Carrie? In case she doesn't have, uh, here you are. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you both for this presentation. I, I was really struck by the stance you take in kind of leading the social justice work with your students and being really like compassionate and empathetic towards the other or different perspectives. And I don't always see that being kind of the gut reaction to a lot of like newer students who are trying to work in this area. So I was curious about how you teach that type of stance and perspective to students who are just starting on this journey. I got an email the other day, I hope this is an example, but I got an email the other day from a former student. She uh, thanked me for what we did together in class around this very topic. And then she let me know that she received an opportunity to be a peer coordinator, something like that, where she works with her middle school students. And this is in addition to her teaching. She's a first year teacher, um, working with them to help them unpack and understand diversity, equity, and inclusion in their school, and then share the information and be a catalyst for change within the school. And she asked me, she mentioned some things that we had spoken of and that we had learned together. And then she asked me for some resources. So for me, that right there was an example of why I do this work. So just think about it. I taught her and now she's teaching every single kid who she comes into contact with. So that's the approach that I've been taking. It's, it could be slow, but I think that's one approach. 
And one thing that comes up for me, um, and hopefully I heard your comment the way you had intended, um, is I find, especially with this younger generation, they come into my classroom feeling like they're very, and I'm just gonna use this term, woke, right? That they have arrived, they understand how the system works, they understand the inequities that exist in it. And what I, <laughs> I'm just gonna be candid, what I do is I kind of burst that bubble a little bit and I let them know, okay, well, what we're doing here is learning about the things that you may not realize you learned along the way. Because if I say that I'm woke, that means I have nothing to learn. I have nothing to work through, which also means that if there is stuff there and there's stuff in all of us, as mentioned in the previous slide, then I'm gonna have missed opportunity to see where I was off where I was hurtful, where I was not inclusive because I was so fixated on the fact that I'm so open-minded. And so I have that candid conversation with students like, I love how committed you are. I love how much you want that awareness. I love, love, love that. I wish we had that from even generations before in the same level, but you gotta be really careful because there's a delicate dance you have to have and maintain that if I'm so stuck on how open I am that I feel like there's nothing that I need to do to improve. But what I let them know is knowledge is not enough, desire is not enough, and having a diverse circle of friends is not enough. That social justice is much deeper than that. It's about changing, I'm gonna go a little cheesy on us, I'm changing hearts and minds. It's about a paradigm shift emotionally and intellectually. So um, that's kind of how I address it. I don't know if that was in line with what you were kind of commenting on, Jessica, but that's what came up for me. Thank you, Beth. That was excellent. Uh, Carrie, I think you will, uh, you will have the, maybe the last question or comment. Hopefully not forever. Um, no, thank just, you both. Just, I, was, just... <laughs> I was particularly appreciative of how you presented together. I felt like you modeled much of what you're talking about, about including and inclusion of each other and Anyway, I just think that teaches people a lot. Um, and in some ways, what I'm about to ask, you've sort of started answering in some of your answers to the other questions, but I was really, and Michelle knows we actually had a conversation the other day about this. I was thinking about what you were saying about moments when you feel reactive to what somebody in your class is saying, to when you feel like they're, they're not getting with the program, they're not thinking the way you want them to think, all the things that come up can come up. And just share, I, I think those are really hard moments. And I think we teach as much in how we respond in those moments as in what we say, right? If we quickly shut it down and tell them they're wrong or that's not, I think we, so I was wondering if you have any examples of ways you've responded to that or been working on responding to that in your own practice that, that teaches students that we, we don't need to jump in every time somebody says something that we don't like, um, or even beyond we don't like, you know, that is, yeah. Would you like to, okay. <laughs> I was gonna make a joke. I don't know what you're talking about, Carrie, I'm perfect. So that never happens to me, <laughs> but that, that was just a joke. Well, I hope joke. so, um, because then you can tell me what to do. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> um, and thank you. I saw, I'm going to look at that podcast so I can learn a little bit more um, about the unschooling because that's new for me. So thanks for sharing that. And also I saw, Alisa, you shared that really great quote that, um, from the Dalai Lama that I'm totally going to use. Um, you know, when I'm in that moment of like, oh goodness, Christine. So I have the, as an educator, I'm guessing like me, many of you've had to learn to develop a poker face. And so I have my poker face on. I'm like, oh, goodness, how do I respond to this? So there's some go-tos that I do. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Or this is what I heard. Was that what you meant? Or did I hear you? I want to see if this is what I heard. Is that what you intended? Um, can you, or can you elaborate on that a little bit? Because I want to understand and be on the same page with you. And sometimes when I go there, it already has that person where they're starting to process what they said. And then they're like, Oh, that's not what I meant. <laughs> or even carry another thing that I do is I say, okay, I have some thoughts on this, whether or not I do. Right. But I see that there's some reactions in the room Would someone like to share a thought or response. And then I kind of give it to the class, which mm -hmm. is even more important, right? Because mm -hmm. I want them to be able to process. They should bring me in later. Like I shouldn't be the focus. 
So I really try to um, make it about their process and conversation um, and remove myself as much as possible. And then it gives me a little bit more time to figure out what I want to say. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, <laughs> no, we're short on time. One thing that I say often is, and I'm very intentional about it, strategic, I'm going to step back so I can make room for others. Mm -hmm. and I model that for my students from the first day of class through the end. Mm -hmm. And they begin to use that same language and let each other into one another into the conversation instead of me being a sage on stage. Mm -hmm. And I know we're at wait, over time already, but if I may just share something really quickly, I think the other piece too is in that moment where there needs to be feedback that I do find ways to do that. If it's a safe enough environment and I can gently and from a loving place and caring place, give that feedback in the group, I will. Or I will offer a conversation with that student to follow up in my office hours or right after class. So um, I do try to find ways to, to kindly, sensitively give that feedback with the understanding that just as much as I'm rooted in who I am, they're also rooted in who they are. And what they shared with me is an expression of what they've been taught. Okay, thank but you. meeting them where they're at, not where, not where I want them to be, which is that mm -hmm. other well, Michelle and Christine, thank you so much for a fantastic presentation, which has given us all a lot of great ideas for us to use. And um, uh, we look forward to receiving your, your, your uh, slides. And um, uh, th thanks so much for being here. And thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, so I'll say again, uh, this is our last uh, Learning Sciences and, Friend Brown, and Friends Brown Bag for this semester. And we will see you again in January. Thank you so much. I also um, did put in the PowerPoints. I hope people saw that. Hopefully people saw that. Oh, great. Yeah, I'll so do it let's, one more time. Uh, Danielle, Here. keep it open long enough for people to go in and, and download that <laughs> from chat. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I hadn't noticed, so thank you for telling. No, oh, no, no worries. There's lots, lots of moving pieces here. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. So much. I'll just put in the um, other link one more time if we just have a second, and then just in case people didn't get it. My apologies for not mentioning it earlier. I have the files too, so if anyone needs anything, they can email. Yeah, thank you. You, so much. you have saved the chat, right? Because there's lots of great uh, links in here. I hope the chat is saved. <laughs> it, should, it should save with the recording, Danielle. It saves, yeah. Yeah, it should save automatically. Well, acting is Ravit today, so we're going for it. <laughs> so, so Ravit can retrieve us. Yes, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so very much. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank Bye. you. That was amazing. Thanks so much. Thank you.